All right, good morning, everyone. I think that seems to be quite a few uh, already come through the room, which is great to see. Um, we will get started uh, now, as uh, you would have seen in the email that Jess uh, sent out. If you could uh, just keep your mics on mute while we're going through this, but if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll have some time at the end where we'll, we'll get onto a bit of a discussion and kind of uh, answer any questions you have then. Uh, I'm obviously going to get lots of dings here of everyone joining in that room. I'll just try and turn that off. All right. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming along today's event. Uh, I think it should be a really interesting conversation. We're really looking forward to um, to going through this all with you. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which uh, we are all meeting today um, and acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging, and also acknowledge their contribution to uh, global society and including global development and the work that, that they do do in ensuring Indigenous knowledge uh, in Australia and globally. Uh, so to start with, uh, I know a few of you, there's a few familiar names uh, in the list, but for those of you who don't know who I am, and hopefully this goes through, my name is Joel. Uh, I'm recently just started as Senior Manager of Entrepreneurship in the UQ Ventures team. Um, which I know doesn't sound very relevant to global development, so I'll put in some of the other things I do uh, outside of UQ. I run a thing called Indead Media, which is a weekly newsletter on development. I also have my own consulting company. Uh, and pre previously, I was part of uh, the UQ International Development Team, looking after a lot of our strategic initiatives, uh, including setting up the Global Development Hub. Um, so it's great to be here and to be talking with all of you about global development again. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start really, really broad, um, have a bit of a conversation around what is global development, what it, what it can be, um, what kind of activities are involved in it, look a little bit at what, what isn't quite global development. We're going to go from this massive picture of what is it globally and come all the way down to what does it look like at UQ uh, and how you guys can all get involved or how people can get involved here at the university. So what does it mean? Uh, in the, the recently launched uh, last year Global Development Impact Plan, uh, the definition that we used, that was used is that global development is the process of change linked to improved outcomes in human development and environmental sustainability. Specifically at UQ, this expertise is applied through various modes spanning from development projects, field work, technical advice, capacity building, applied research, knowledge management and policy making. Now, if that sounds uh, exceedingly broad and pretty much covers a lot of things, that's because that's pretty much what global development is. It, it's a really hard concept to narrow down specifically because it is, it is about human development. It's about global development. It's about people's lives improving uh, economically, health, um, socially, in all kinds of different assets. So it's a really hard uh, concept to really get a really specific and, and narrow definition on. So this definition we use does help us to think more. One of the key things about development is that its focus is on very much an impact. It's about a change. It's about working to, to create improved outcomes and, and seeing a change or an impact happen in communities. So when we think about development, one of the key things a lot of people probably think about it is the charity work that happens or they think about big government uh, engagement. I want to put in here a few of the different ideas of, of ways that development can happen, different types of development. So there is the bilateral and the multilateral uh, development. That's where governments will give money to other governments or to big uh, banks, such as the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank. But there is also the NGOs and the, the charity kind of side. There's the government sponsored. Um, projects is the word that I'm missing in that box, sorry. Um, and, and so those are, are around where the government actually will support and deliver activities um, through partners. There's the commercial side of development, which is where there's a lot of consultancies who do deliver development expertise uh, for commercial rates. There's also a few of these other ones that the pro don't come. There's a lot of startups in global development. Um, so there's people that are doing some really innovative stuff around technology. There's people that work in social enterprise. Um, there's others that look at um, AI and technology, data collection, the satellite um, initiatives, all kinds of things that go on that do have a very much a development focus. There's community-based activities, and often these are not actually based in Australia, but based in the communities 
um, themselves. And when we think about development, usually we think about this idea of uh, big, um, quite wealthy countries like Australia and the US or the UK giving money or giving expertise and doing work. But development can also happen within the communities themselves. And so when you see groups uh, in Fiji, for example, or in Solomon Islands working together to things, that is a type of development happening. There's knowledge sharing where we do try and help share knowledge from research or from uh, analysis or work or just experience and knowledge that we have here in other countries or other communities. And we do try and share them around the world. There's policy development. Um, which is a really key aspect of working with governments to improve governance. There's debt relief. Um, many of you might have known there's uh, for a number of economies, particularly emerging economies, the amount of debt that they pay uh, is staggering um, sometimes. And so a really key aspect of development is also the debt relief where uh, those debts are wiped off. And then there's South-South co cooperation. And I really wanted to, to ensure this one was on there, this idea of same we talked about with the community where we think of development as big countries, rich countries coming in and supporting it. A lot of development also happens between countries themselves, um, not necessarily with a US or Australia or, or in, you know, UK kind of involvement. Um, and there's some really interesting activities happening in that space of where countries in Africa are engaging with other countries in Southeast Asia and sharing knowledge about how they work and working together towards some shared outcomes. So as you can see that there's a, a huge range of different areas there and probably some of them a bit different to what we usually think of as development. And I'll go through a couple of the different sectors here to again just kind of really dig down there is lots more people in this sector than we usually think about. So there's obviously the national governments, Australian government, giving money to the UN, banks, things like that. There's the commercial consultants and for a lot of commercial consultancies these are really big big organizations. Um, if you have, uh, if you look at say the Australian aid program, the Australian aid program is usually around $4 billion a year. Now, most of that, the largest part of that actually goes to either the development banks or to debt relief or to bilateral sharing of, of funds, which is where Australia will give money to say Papua New Guinea um, for an activity. But a huge component of it, in fact, so the second or almost equal kind of aspect of it is where programs are delivered through commercial companies. And so you get organizations, generally they're very large companies, um, groups like uh, Cardno, uh, group Cardno International Development, there's another one called Palladium, um, Coffee, which is now called Tetra Tech. These are global companies with huge amounts of money with thousands of staff all around the world that focus on the delivery of global development activities. And they do it as a fee-for-service, that they're not charities or organizations, they're very commercially minded, uh, and they approach it from a very commercial private sector approach. But they are very efficient in what they do, and they can actually deliver things in very high levels of, of quality and, and for lower costs. And so they are becoming a, a very key, well, no, they are very key, but they're becoming even more so a central part of global development delivery and impact uh, around the world. The other one, though, the, the major one that we all think about mostly is the charity kind of sector, the NGOs, um, often funded through donations that do also get funding from the governments. They're the ones who will deliver on the ground and they usually have a much stronger community um, engagement focus and really deeply embedded into the communities that they are trying to support. The other ones on the bottom are, are the development banks, World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank, um, all those other kind of big banks. They do a lot of fantastic work. Again, though, their funds come from the national governments um, and they focus a lot more on delivering loans, delivering major infrastructure projects, delivering really big activities um, into these different countries. Research activities, uh, and we'll dig into this one a little bit later. Research uh, activities to try and understand global challenges and then trying to create impact and change of them is a part of the development sector. It is a part of how development knowledge is grown um, and how part of, of how we understand what is needed is, is developed. Having said that though, there also needs to be, uh, I guess, a balance in that research in itself um, is, leads towards development, but it's not necessarily a development activity. We'll talk about this in a little bit of a second. And then there's the UN, um, which while I kind of align a bit with the development banks and the national governments, the UN agencies, the UN 
uh, community is, is just a massive aspect of global development uh, and the number of organizations involved in there and the amount of work that they do it makes them in, in and of themselves a really central aspect of development. So my keyboard has stopped working. There you go. All right. Um, so what kind of activities do you think? So we talked about like the global structure and I guess kind of the core sectors and the core actors that are within global development. But I really wanted everyone to think a little bit about what type of things do you, do you hear, think of when you hear global development? Because it, as I said at the start, it's one of these terms that people may know. You might know international development or you might know international aid quite well. Um, but you might not necessarily think about what actually is involved in global development, what are the actual activities that happen. And along with that, some of the ideas that you have are probably correct, but there's a lot more that does go on that you might not be able to think of. So some of the really big ones that we can think of, and these are probably some of the ones that you did think of, would be a big health program in Papua New Guinea funded by the Australian government. That's a pretty standard, it's a pretty, pretty core cool kind of model of how global development does happen. Uh, there's the charities, there's groups like Oxfam working in small communities, setting up uh, wash uh, water stations in, in crisis situations and things like that. And then there's the loans and the funding and the official development assistance, uh, which is where the Australian government will give a loan to, to someone, like a, a picture there of, uh, I think it was Australian Indonesia um, loans. They're the type of really big activities, and there's obviously more, I, I haven't covered every detail of this, but they're the really big ones uh, that we often think about. But I wanted to highlight that there's also some different ones that we might not be as familiar with. So some kinds of development activities that you can think of are, are drones. Uh, there's a really amazing organization called Swoop Aero that does, uses drones for medical supplies uh, shipping across uh, Africa. And they're also doing some work in Vanuatu, I think. Not truly what you think of as a development actor, um, this idea of drones and a technology startup, um, but they are actually a very central part of the infrastructure for medical supplies in those countries and where they're working. Uh, another example of a really great development program is a TV show in the Pacific called the Pacific uh, Food Revolution. Again, it, it's set up as a master chef type show uh, and probably not quite what you would think of as a development project but it is funded by the Australian Aid Program, and it's actually had some really great impacts in promoting uh, local ingredients and local cooking styles across the Pacific Island by showcasing what is possible through these different activities, through these different ingredients um, and cooking styles. So even though we, we might not think about it as a traditional kind of development program, it's actually had some really fantastic impact on health outcomes in the Pacific Islands, on um, use of local ingredients, reducing the need for um, environmental impact of shipping and all kinds of different aspects. There's a lot of bits that flow out of this beyond what we would picture normally. And the last one is student exchange. Um, and that can be both our students from Australia going overseas and providing internships and support and study engagements uh, in international places. So the new Colombo plan is an intern provides opportunities for students to go and uh, do internships or work in greater learning in other countries and has been able to really help build the connections between Australia and those countries in different ways. It helps share knowledge um, and it helps share, I guess, a, a really good relationship. But yeah, and then there's also the reverse way where students can come from other countries to Australia and study here. And that is a really key development outcome. In fact, in some countries that is um, for Australia, our major development impact in, say, African continent is through student scholarships and students coming to Australia to study. It's where we really worth it. So, what is in development? Now, this may be a bit of a controversial conversation, so I'm going to be very careful uh, how I say this. What is in development uh, can focus on humanitarian response. Now, humanitarian response, usually when we think about international aid, we would probably lump them together. Development is focused more on the long-term uh, improvements and growth and development of that country. Humanitarian response is more dealing with immediate natural disasters or conflict activities. Now, there is a lot of connections between the two. So that, for example, disaster resilience and preparation for disasters can be part of a development activity. Um, and after, a natural disaster has happened or a conflict has happened, there is a lot of development work that happens afterwards to try and help 
rebuild that country and rebuild those communities. But specifically itself, that actual humanitarian response isn't really a development outcome. It's a very much a humanitarian disaster um, focus. And so often when we talk about development, we usually focus more on these longer term, bigger programs that do last long and have a really sustained engagement or sustained impact. Whereas disaster and humanitarian response, very short, very, very targeted kind of response that we're looking for. Uh, knowledge creation, research studies which create knowledge but don't necessarily apply it. So I talked earlier about this um, idea of research is a part of development. Research leads into a lot of development and, and development activities rely heavily on the insights and the knowledge developed through research. But there is, I, I guess, a bit of a, a line that crosses between it. And this line isn't a clear one, it's, it's a spectrum. Um, where if it's research for just creating research and creating knowledge, then that's more on the research side. Development has to be focused more on an activity or an output or an impact. Um, so when you see research coming out on new models of I don't know, crops, agricultural understanding, or if there's a new research into governance arrangements and things like that, if they're just seeking to understand, um, then it's important, it's critical. But kind of fits more on that research side, whereas if it also has an aspect of delivery and impact and change, how do we use that knowledge to improve a community or improve resources? Then it can be aspects. So there is this kind of weird balance. And, and I don't at all mean that there's, there's no alignment. There's a huge crossover. There is a huge engagement, particularly when you get into research impact um, and research alignment and, and how they can be where practical research is involved that does have an impact, then there can be parts of it that are development activities. So it's not at all to say that research, and this is probably the one I knew was going to be a bit confidential, but it's not at all to say research isn't development, but that kind of the goal of it and how it's delivered is really key. It can be research and development, um, but it can also just be research and it can also just be development. It depends on where it's focused and how it's being delivered. And the last one, which really isn't development, is kind of operations which extract value from countries. So a lot of programs are designed to build the economic um, abilities of countries, to build economies, to get new uh, foreign investment in the countries and things like that. That can all be part of development, particularly if there's activities to try and promote more investment in that country. But there needs to be, there's a balance again on that side in that if it's just um extracting the value if there's no real investment in improving the country if the money doesn't flow if wages are ridiculously low and not really um fair or, or correct then it's not really a development impact there's no support there's no benefits to it to that country if it's an activity that, that does provide support if there's an activity that does bring more money and more investment and more decent living wages into that country, then it can definitely be a key part of the development process. And there is a number of really large programs, whether it's from the Australian government or US governments that do focus on how do we build the economic um, capacity, how do we build the economic opportunities in different countries, and whether that is attracting new investors, building partnerships between businesses in each country and, and deliveries like that. They are very much development focused activities, but, there needs to be this balance again. Across those three, I guess the key thing that I really want to highlight is that development can happen in all kinds of different ways. It can look quite different. And so even though you look at development as being just this kind of program delivering nice new um, health facilities in Papua New Guinea, there is a really broad spectrum of what is part of development and what has development impact. But there is, and so for these particular areas, there's kind of this fuzzy line where it does cross between each of them. And for us as a university, for us as UQ, I think thinking about those lines really helps us to understand where we can fit and where we can have the most impact and opportunities. So this keyboard is gone again. All right, uh, so how does UQ engage in global development? So like I talked about that, this is the this is at a macro level, the huge global kind of level. Global development is this massive field of work that really focuses on how do we have real impact and change and help support communities. But how does UQ engage in that? Now UQ does it in a number of different ways. One of them uh, that we're gonna I'll touch on quickly is around teaching and our students. 
So there is part of, of our work that we do through the scholarships. So as I said, there is a number of scholarships here where in touch students will come to Australia, really grow and develop their knowledge and their understanding, um, get a, a world-class education, and then are able to take that back to their countries and, and work there. There's the student societies. So, you know, there's Engineers Without Borders, there's Red Cross, there's Oxfam, there's others that I've totally forgotten. Right now, that do focus on, on bringing students together to think about these kind of global development activities. And they do a lot of really fantastic work. And then there's the academic programs where we do teach development. Uh, there's a master's of development practice. There is uh, social entrepreneurship programs that look at global activities. There's development economics. There's uh, activities at SMI that look at development minerals. There's all kinds of different ones where people can learn around development and, and its various facets. In, in the research side, there is a huge amount that does happen that does align with global development. And this can definitely be around research, particularly when there is a research um, impact, research opportunities, that applied research kind of approach. Um, they can have an impact and change in these kind of communities. There's the commercialization. So particularly there, I'm thinking about opportunities that have gone through Uniquest in say health or in other areas where research or insights that have been developed here at the university have been commercialized and are now being rolled out. The big one that I think gets mentioned a lot is, is around Gardasil and the health impacts that's had on HPVs, and that's been rolled out in a number of development country, developing or emerging countries. Um, and then there's knowledge partnerships, which again is where us, where we as a university partner with other universities. Uh, we have a number of partnerships going in Indonesia, in um, in Vietnam and a number of different countries where we do try and share our knowledge both as a research institution but also in teaching and developing um, programs and knowledge development. These are really really key kind of ways of how a university engages in development sectors and for most universities this is kind of the, the core focus and this makes a huge amount of impact, it makes a huge amount of opportunities and is really critical, particularly, I, th I think, mostly in that applied research um, focus. But for UQ, we, we also have a different path in that we, we've recently started this global development um, at UQ plan, particularly with the global development impact plan. So the plan was launched um, last year and um, and the plan is very much focused on how can the University of Queensland become a leader in global development uh, in our region. Uh, you'll see in the new UQ strategy that came out just recently by 2032, UQ will be known as a university um, that has extensive reach in education and research, but with a strong commitment to capacity building in the Indo-Pacific. And that's really one of the key focuses in the global development plan. We want to be known as a university that engages, that supports uh, capacity building, that supports um, development across this entire region in lots of different facets. And one of the key aspects or key parts of that plan is the creation of this global development hub, which is what we're, we're talking through today, um, to try and bring together all the different parts of global development at UQ. So like I talked about, there is all these teaching parts, there's all these research parts. How do we kind of connect everyone together that is aligned and a part of global development? How do we bring them together to help enhance it? Um, how do we bring them together to start conversations on what more the university could do, what other opportunities there are for the university to get involved? And then also, how do we align that with the other part of what we do, which is in UQ International Development? So that's uh, the unit within the university that focuses on delivery of these kind of programs. So UQID doesn't work um, on that research side. It's very much focused on delivery of projects and, and taking the insights and the knowledge um, and the expertise from researchers and academics, teaching staff, professional staff, and all of our partners, and how do we bring them all together to deliver programs and create that an impact? There's a really big focus on, um, on how do we bring all those different parts together to create an opportunity and create a university that is leading in global development. For a lot of universities, the, the scholarships, the teaching aspect, and the applied research, the commercialization of the core focuses. One of the really unique things that we can do here at UQ is through units like UQ International Development and then via the hub, 
we can start bringing them together and actually looking at how do we deliver, how do we create impact on the ground in other ways? Um, how do we look at working with communities and governments across the whole Indo-Pacific region to really enhance and grow the opportunities and the impact that our knowledge and expertise can bring? And how do we work with them to support their goals and their desires and what they are wanting to see in their communities? So, Again, it's a really broad um, sector. And I know I said I'd narrow it right down, but I haven't quite narrowed it down that much. And that's because there's a lot of opportunity here. And we want to work closely with all of you and with others to understand what these opportunities could look like and how we could come together to create an impact and create change on the ground um, with these communities. So in that case, then, how, how do you kind of engage in this global development space? How do you engage with global development at UQ? And there's a few just really key, simple kind of ways that, that we really think about it to get started with and, and go. So the first one is to join the Global Development Hub. Um, so I think Jess is putting some links in the um, in, in the chat at the moment, which will be around joining the hub, which will have a focus on bringing people together. So the hub is where a lot of the information on what's happening in the university will come through, it's where we will engage with people, it's where we will put up opportunities or ideas, and it's where we'll start having these conversations. Eventually the hub will also have communities where we'll get to talk about specific areas of interest, and we might start looking at what opportunities we have. We're also really keen for you to share your ideas. Um, so if you have thoughts or ideas on what UQ can do, um, we're really keen to see that. As I said, UQ and touch development is the delivery kind of aspect, and so we really want to um, ensure that we are working across the full breadth of the university and understand who everyone is and what opportunities we can bring uh, and expertise is available for programs. So you can connect with UQID through that and through the hub. Um, attend networking events. So there is a plan of series of events, and I'll get to that in a second, of what is happening in the hub. And we really encourage everyone to come along to as many of them. I'm a huge believer in, in the power of... Uh, corridor conversations of, of incidental conversations and what they can come out with. So I really love bringing people together just to have conversations, even if they're not in aligned areas, even if it's people that you've never met before that do something completely different to you. Often it's those conversations that you have that create the greatest ideas. Um, and so coming along to the events that the Hub puts on is a really key part of, of what we want to see because it's what will get the unique ideas and what will help us start on these journeys on what impact UQ can have. And the last one is to develop and present workshops. So the hub uh, is looking to deliver more. We're wanting to get involved in a range of different activities and share a lot of the knowledge that we have. We're really conscious across the university, there's a lot of amazing knowledge and expertise uh, that often people just don't know about. And so we want to make opportunities for people to share that to others that are interested in global development across the university. So these are some of the events that are coming up. As I said, these slides will be coming. Please do join as many of them as you can um, and, and look at what you can do. Now, going forward, and I guess the bigger pictures of, of things that we want to see is eventually what we want to see is by bringing people together, we can come up with ideas, we can come up with uh, initiative or project proposals or ideas that we might be able to look at. We can, when opportunities come through to us from, say, DFAT or from the UN, where you can engage with more people across the university to help deliver those activities. But these only really work if people are engaged and connected to the Global Development Hub and to these networks. So I really, really want to encourage you, everyone, and this isn't for just academics, it's for students, it's for professional staff, it's for teaching staff, it's for researchers, everyone to be involved and be a part of these conversations. The more involved you can be, then the more likely we are to be able to build and grow ideas of real impact and change. So that's it. I've seen a couple of questions just quickly come through. So I'm just going to jump on them. Whoa. Um, let's do that. Jean, uh, rationale of UQ focusing on the Indo Pacific area as a capacity event. Uh, look, so <laughs> there's two aspects to, to the question. So the questions around rationale focusing on the Indo Pacific. Um, Indo Pacific as a term is a bit loose. Um, and so it can mean. Uh, anything from Africa to South America, anything that kind of touches the Indian or the Pacific Oceans, um, or it just means kind of more the Asia-Pacific region. We take a, a pretty broad view on that, 
And so as a university, we do do a lot of work and engagement in Africa. Um, we're recently doing some work with Australia with Africa. I know uh, with the School of Public Health and UQID, there's an activity going on in Ethiopia at the moment. So there is more happening there. There's also a lot happening in South America. I guess the, the other part of the rationale though is while we do touch on these broader countries and broader areas, as a university and, and as a, a organization based in Brisbane, based in Queensland, Australia, the kind of near neighbors are our, our close opportunities and they're where we can engage and connect with most readily and have the most impact and already have the most existing connections. So for us, one of the really key parts is to work with organizations that we do have connections with. So say in the Pacific, we want to work with groups that we are, that have it. UQ has a large Pacific data diaspora community. Um, we have a lot of alumni in the Pacific region. We have a lot of alumni in Southeast Asia. And so they're where we really want to engage and focus because that's where we have the most um, connections and remit and opportunity. I, I guess there is a, a part of thinking um, if our specific expertise is needed, if there are opportunities in other countries around the world, then we will happily look at it. And if there is initiatives or ideas that we want to explore that are in other places, then we we can definitely look at it. We're not at all limiting it just to that region. It's more an acknowledgement though that this is the region that we're based in and this is the region where we can have the most impact and connections and opportunities. Um, it's just also the region where the Australian government is focused. And so again, as an institution based in Australia, we, we work a lot with the Australian government in a lot of their programs and they're heavily invested uh, in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia. Um, and so we work alongside that. I guess the, the other aspect I'll talk about is that and probably didn't cover too much here, but one of the ways that UQ does do a lot of this work is we do partner with other institutions. And so if we wanted to do work, say, in, in South America or in North Asia somewhere, we were more likely to partner with other organisations who are maybe more closely geographically laid, located or have more extensive connections into those countries. Um, a core focus, I think, for, for me in a lot of development activities needs to be what's the value that we provide and what provides the most value. Rather than stretching us to try and cover everything, let's focus on what we can provide really well and how we can connect to someone else who can enhance and complement that activities. So a lot of our work is actually done in, in partnership. Um, and, and that's probably mostly happens in, in those kind of broader regions uh, away from the Indo-Pacific. I think is that I think that if there's any other questions, please do drop them in now. Um, I hope that answered your question, Jean. We go from there. Paul, but there is applied impact research. Yeah, Paul kind of covered my my point exactly. There, there is research um, is a pretty broad term as well, and so if you look at applied impact research, there is a lot of that that works to uh, achieve development outcomes. Um, and so it's definitely not at all saying research isn't development and there's, there's a clear separation between the two. There is a lot that does cross over and it depends on how it's being delivered, uh, what that focus is um, and how it works. But certainly if there's uh, applied aspects, then there's a lot of development outcomes that can come through it. I think the unique opportunity we have here at UQ with the Global Development Hub and with UQ International Development is enhancing this to the next level again, where it goes from um, applied research and brilliant to then really sustained, engaged development, impact-focused activities and program delivery. Uh, oops, I'm just came through. Um, what would be a way professional staff could contribute if you're not a thought leader academic in a particular field of development? We have a, the, the hub is designed very much to, to draw on everyone's expertise. Um, because there is a lot of expertise and knowledge that, um, i trying to think how to phrase this, but uh, that sits within professional staff across the university that is really needed and critical for a lot of work that happens uh, globally. Uh, so one example I'll, I'll give you really quickly is actually Eco International Development. Recently, we're delivering a program uh, on universities in Papua New Guinea and how to support them. Um, and, so through that work, we actually engaged with a number of professional staff to help deliver those programs to the next place on how to run and manage universities, how to run um, 
different units within the universities and aspects like that. We have another program where um, we work with uh, students that have come to Australia under the Australia Awards program and they're now returning uh, back to their countries. And so we do a reintegration where we help support them through that process. Uh, we work heavily with the sponsored students team uh, within global engagement on and as delivery partners where they do come in and speak to the participants around those kind of things. So there can be a lot of very different aspects that we can engage professional staff with. It really depends on what whatever they are and how we can get, also get it. The, the professional staff are really key as well in, in, I guess, navigating through how everything can work in the university. Oh, uh, Jess has just stolen my answer. Um, <laughs> but they are kind of, professional staff to us are, are really central across the university and how we navigate and bring everyone together um, in this space. So for us to work with a lot of global development uh, programs, we do need to work across the whole university, both academic and also professional staff in order to get the right expertise that we need, um, and, but also navigate to the right people, the right partners. So for us, the, the hub, we really want to see a really good mix of staff in that we don't want to, I think I'd be pretty disappointed if the hub was all just academic staff. Um, not that there's anything wrong with academic staff, I'm not saying that at all. But um, I really want to see that kind of mix because it's the mix of expertise that's needed. One of the things when I talked earlier about just how broad global development is, one of the really key things in that too is that it needs expertise and knowledge and experience of all types, whether it's academic and research, whether it's professional, whether it's delivery and program management, whether it's relationships, all of those skills and expertise are needed in order to, del to deliver these kind of development outcomes. And so we want to see as many people as we can connected in so that then when we are looking at these opportunities, um, or when opportunities come from the group in these discussions, they are actually harnessing the full breadth of expertise and knowledge. I think that's a question. Uh, is this primarily for UQ students and researchers or other tertiary institutions as well? Uh, that is an excellent question. So at the moment, the Global Development uh, Hub is a UQ-focused um, activity. It's very much around in harnessing UQ's expertise, knowledge, and experience to do that. Having said that, though, we are conscious, so actually, no, our strong desire and preference is that a lot of programs we don't deliver individually, we don't deliver separately as ourselves. And so we do partner with other institutions, um, whether they're tertiary or whether they're commercial organizations or community groups. We try and deliver as much as we can. And I think particularly going forward, we'll need to do this even more um, in partnership with other organizations. Eventually the hub, um, so this first year of the hub is focused on this mapping and connecting everyone in together in UQ. But the next activity, and I guess the next stage of it, is start looking at how do we how do we connect UQ into all these other organisations, and so how do we build partnerships? How do we build connections with other institutions or other experts or with funders or with community organisations that if they want to do some work in, in this kind of global development space as well, they know where to come to at UQ that they can connect in with us. Um, so I think that that's, that's very much the second stage. Uh, this first stage though was really about trying to link everyone together across this university currently, because we're really conscious um, of just how separate they can be. And I remember uh, a few times going to Papua New Guinea um, and, and meeting with somebody there and, and being told that there was someone from UQ visiting the same person the day before, um, and we didn't know about each other at all. So. It's kind of what we want to get, get away from now is being able to have these networks and collaborations together where we're not controlling, we're not at all interested in managing or running all these different activities, but just so that we're all connected or we all know what's happening. And then if when we build partnerships, we can actually leverage them properly. Uh, what particular trends in global development initiatives is UQ working as their priority focus? The GQ shift their priorities compared during pre and post pandemic initiatives? Uh, really good question, Gene. So, um, there is six core theme areas that we're focusing on at the moment. Uh, there is agriculture, health, environment, um, resources and energy, governance and public policy and innovation and entrepreneurship. They're the six themes that were written into the, the Global Development Impact Plan um, that we really wanted to focus in across those six areas. Having said that, though, the, the themes are pretty loose um, and they're also pretty uh flexible in terms that we can change some of them and, and we may look at doing that 
But we're also really conscious that a lot of what happens in global development doesn't fit into one particular theme uh, or one particular area. So um, a lot of what happens in agricultural activities, for example, actually relies heavily on governance. Um, and there's a lot of entrepreneurial activities and innovation that happens in that space as well. So the themes are designed to be this um, a starting point and to build networks and connections, but then we're, we're hoping to try and see how they can cross across each other. Um, we've we've appointed three uh, thematic leads currently to help drive these. So we have an environmental uh, lead, which is Karen McNamara. We have uh, York, who is leading the agriculture pass, and we have Paul Rogers, who's doing the uh, energy and resources. And we're hoping to appoint some for the others um, later. These kind of themes, though. I think will we'll emerge and will evolve. And I think you're, you're spot on with the pre and post pandemic. Um, it does change the environment. It does change how we think about what is needed and how we approach things. We've set up these six core themes to, to start with and to explore. They may completely change afterwards. If you're talking about specific uh, initiatives and activities, then we don't re actually really have too many at the moment. And that's partly on purpose. Because what we wanted to see is bringing people together and starting to think about what those initiatives could be, what, what could be something that we could do, where could we focus our attention on specific areas. We're really conscious that um, on one hand, there is just a huge amount of need and there's a broad range of areas where we can focus. But also we want to make sure that whatever we kind of do do, it does align with expertise and knowledge in the university. And so rather than us coming in with an answer of already what exactly we're going to do and hoping that there's the right people here, what we're trying to do is bring everybody together and then through that, see what the right program or initiative is to come out of this. So it's, it's designed very much to be a flexible and a responsive type, type approach. I think we've only got like one minute left. So uh, if there's any final questions, please drop them in. Yeah, Paul. 100% right, Paul is uh, the theme lead for this one. So, but yeah, that, the Hub is really hoping to, to get people to think in new ways about how we can do impact through our work. So it's definitely designed to take off what, what is already happening, a lot of knowledge that's already going on, a lot of expertise that's already being delivered, whether that's in professional staff and delivering activities, whether that's in our research, whether it's in how we do our teaching. It's designed to, or it's hoped that through this kind of activity and through the Hub, people will be able to take that same expertise and knowledge and apply it in different ways that can have a huge impact. Um, we're not trying to create new skills. We're not creating new roles. We're not creating new big um, buildings or, or programs and things like that. This is more about bringing together what people already have, the expertise and knowledge that's already here at the university and how do we bring everybody together um, and think about how we can use these things and use this expertise in different ways to create impact. So I'll just give it one second if there's any final questions. Um, but I think I think that that might be oh okay yeah. Um, look, thank you everybody for for today. I know that was a pretty rushed um, presentation, but I hope you got a bit out of it. The slides will be shared soon. If you have any further questions. Um, please do not hesitate to, to contact the Global Development Hub and send them through. Um, we can answer uh, those questions over email as well. Please do join the Global Development Hub, uh, join these conversations. We really want to have everyone's perspective and insights into this uh, to help enhance and grow this, this program. And I think it's a really exciting opportunity for the university. Um, so please do join in. Thank you very much for joining. And we will hopefully see you all at Global Development events uh, very, very soon. Thank you.